Hungry Trilobite podcast would like to start by acknowledging SoonerCon. The longest running pop culture con in Oklahoma has a new look, a new mascot, and a fantastic guest list. Join us in Norman, Oklahoma, June 30th through July 2nd, 2023, and meet celebrities such as Billy West, John Scalzi, Erica Harlicker, and John Swayze. Visit SoonerCon.com to reserve your membership. On tap today, we have Brad Hornbacher. How are you doing this fine day? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm doing great. I'm looking forward to talking with you here because uh, I'm a huge MST3K fan, and you are one of the writing talents behind the movie Werewolf, which is one of my favorite episodes. So I really want to just kind of pick your brain a little bit here. Sure, go right ahead. Well, first of all, because there were two writers on the screenplay, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And that means I have a 50-50 chance of being talking to the guy who coined the phrase nose to anus. Was that you or not? Yes, that was me. All right. And, and I actually got that. That's actually a quote from the Navajo legend okay. and, and how uh, the whole Skinwalker thing. That whole segment of that, that, that dialogue in there was taken from the Navajo legend because that's how they, that's how they described the change. The, the, the whole bit with the sleepy nose to anus like a coyote, you know, the whole bit. But well, that I mean, actually ended up in a dictionary, like the Webster's online dictionary or something is a quote. <laughs> good good to know. I mean, it makes sense. You're not wrong, but it's just a, such a weird phrase to pop out that it just sticks in your mind. Yeah, I, I actually wrote most of the movie, but Tony changed things on, on location and I, I wasn't allowed on location because he knew I was, I was probably going to try to keep him re restrained, which I'm glad I didn't get, mm -hmm. get on location. Because he was going to have me try to restrain him. You know, he's afraid I'm going to try to, no, don't do that. You know, but I'm glad it ended up the way it did. It wouldn't, couldn't have gotten any better than this. It's one of those cases where everything is right. It, it's just one of those movies that it's a fun time, no matter why you're watching it. I know I'm not a huge horror fan. I'm a huge sci-fi fan. Right. But I, and I just love drive-in style movies, even though it was made in the nineties, it's very much a drive-in spirited movie. Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure that was by accident, but <laughs> you know, that is what it is, but it's, it's great. It's a total drive-in movie. I'd, I'd actually like to see it. I wish MSTK could take their version and put it in a theater, you know, put it in theaters as a mm -hmm. theatrical release, because I know the audiences would just be dying with them. Cause like we, we hold screenings at my buddy's house, like every year or two. And we invite people that have never seen it before. And everybody just, loses their mind they just laugh their asses off you know well, it, i know that they i mean they've done mst3k shows live in various venues it couldn't be that much more difficult to set that up i would think i'm not you know an ip lawyer but it seems like it's one of those things that we could make that happen well that would be that would be really great that'd be that'd be, it'd be I, I tell you it'd be extremely popular i believe because a lot of people don't know of MSTK outside of the MSTK fans and that, but there are thousands and thousands of those, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, you know, just like, it's just like with my band, we, all of our records were released in Europe and Germany and America is not really aware of us because none of it was ever released over here. So our following's over there, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I just, I think the more people that see MSTK just, just love it. Not just our episode, but every episode, because it's such a great show. Right. Now you put the screenplay together. You said you weren't on set. You weren't on the scenes at all. So you basically put this, you know, put your screenplay together. You send it off into the world and see what happens. How is this coming together in your head when you're putting it together? Well, well let me, let me, let me back up a little bit and give you a little okay. background on Tony and how I met him mm -hmm. and how, how this, how werewolf developed. Because uh, what happened was I met Tony at a, an American film market. I don't know if you ever heard of the American film market. It's I know like, of uh, it. It's like the low budget con film festival, you know, sure. and it's in LA every year. And I, I, I was, I was going there shopping another project of mine that uh, I had some, some, I mean, it's, it's not this kind of a project. It was a, a horror film, but I had like KMB effects were involved in it. And I had some name actors and stuff involved in it. And I was shopping at, and I'm trying to raise financing and stuff. And I kept seeing this guy every, every year that I go and he had all these beautiful women around him and, and, you know, different actors that I, I recognized and, I'm going, who is this guy? I'd never seen this guy before. And, and then finally I approached him and introduced myself and he told me, Brad, he says, Brad, I'm Tony Zarindast. I am a director, I'm a producer, I'm making movies every year. And he did, he made 23 movies in, in his 50 year career. So he was making a movie every two years. You got to give a guy credit for that. Yeah, no, no. You know, because the output. Like, I go on it, but you know what? It's hard to get any movie made. 
Uh-huh. This guy made a movie every two years. He got it financed, got it distributed. So, you know, the, the guy was getting things done. So uh, Tony said, so Tony, I gave him a copy of my script for, for my project because he wanted because I told him I was a writer and he wanted to read my writing. And uh, I was working on that and everything that got kind of put on hold and stuff. And uh, my uh, my father got sick. And so I moved from L.A. to Orange County to take care of my father. And I get a call from Tony one day and he says, Brad, he says, I love your writing. I want you to write this movie for me. And he says, it's a, an American werewolf in Russia. And I'm like, OK, so he says, I'll pay you some money up front. If you get the financing, then we'll work a deal and da, da, da. And since I was taking care of my dad and I wasn't able to, you know, hustle stuff, I, was, okay, I can do that from home. So, so I wrote this first draft of the American Werewolf in Russia and I sent it to Tony. Next thing I know, a couple of months later, he calls me and says, Brad, the, AFM, the American film market was coming up. And he says, Brad, you have to meet me there. We're meeting the, 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 the big guys from Moz film. They want to back the film. They really want to do the film. And I said, really? Because I don't know if you're familiar with Moz Film. It's the biggest film studio in Russia. They did okay, that I'm not like, familiar with, yeah. You're, you're a science fiction fan. You ever heard of the movie Solaris mm-hmm. and, and uh, Stalker? You know, uh-huh. they're, they're big Russian, and they're big Russian movies. They, they were the producers of those. And they have okay. a studio. They have sure. everything there, right? So I go to the film market and I sit down with these Russians and I mean, <laughs> they, they look like KGB or something, right? Mm-hmm. And, and when I did the research, because I do a, a lot of research, even if I'm doing a, a, a crappy film, I do research. And I did a lot of research on Russia. I had maps of all the cities that it was going to take place in on the wall and all the all the uh, uh, locations. And I had, you know, all the the, the tourist things because I wanted this werewolf thing to like go nuts in Russia, you know? And, and uh, I actually did a like a, an homage to Frankenstein and King Kong in the end of the thing where he changes into the werewolf in St. Petersburg and they're running down the streets and he's being hunted by the all the people and the, the cops and everything. And then it ends with him on one of the spires of one of the cathedrals, you know, those, those beautiful cathedrals they have mm-hmm. and, and helicopters shooting at him and planes and, you know, he gets shot down like King Kong. And I thought there's no way it's going to happen. Well, we meet with the Moss film guys and they go, first of all, how long did you live in Russia? And I said, I've never been to Russia. They go, you know, every location, you, you have this down perfect. We thought you must have lived there forever. And they said, and I said, well, you know, I said, nice. And I told them, you know, I, I know I went a little uh, overboard on the, you know, the action and stuff. They go, no, 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 no. We have military, we have access to military helicopters, planes. We have access to everything, you know, because it's it's the biggest studio in Russia. Right. And they were going to put up half the money and all the and all the goods and services. And then. With that, with that going, Tony was able to go get the, the money for the rest of the thing. And it was it was in the millions. I mean, Tony actually had like a $3 million budget. And this is like in the very early 90s, like 91, 92. And could you imagine Tony doing a movie like that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Knowing what he's doing? Oh, you're letting the dog out? You get two over here too. So, uh, so anyway, um, so these guys are, no, no, we think it's, fantastic we're willing to put up the money so the deal was going through and we i mean i went out and i got my passport ready to go i was you know uh, and i they worked in a good budget for me i was going to make some good money on this thing tony's telling me brad we're going to be walking around russia with suitcases full of rubles you know and all this and all of a sudden he calls me one day like this is like three weeks before we're supposed to go to russia i get a call he said brad brad are you watching tv and i go no he goes turn on the news now and I turn on the news, he goes, he goes, we're screwed, Brad, we're screwed. Then I go, what's wrong? They had a Russian coup. This is the Russian coup in the early 90s. And so it just shut down everything in Russia. And the whole thing went to, went to hell, you know? So that, that shot that down. So about a year goes by, and uh, Tony's doing stuff. I'm taking care of my dad, and I'm trying to get my project going again. And uh, all of a sudden, Tony calls me up, and he says, Brad, he says, I want to do the film again, but this time I want to do it in America. I want to do it in Arizona. He says, it's going to be called Arizona Werewolf. I want you to write this. And so I go, Arizona, and, he, he's, and I needed money at the time because I, I was paying for my dad's medical. It was all screwed up and stuff. So, so I said, okay. And so I, like, I signed a deal for like practically nothing to do this, mm-hmm. right? But I, I said, okay, well, I'm going to go do research again. So I went to, um, Fullerton College has the, the, the biggest archaeology department. When, the way I started the, the Russian version was they found the, the bones in Siberia in the in the arctic and you know all the cold not so i said okay well they 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 found that so i'll have it 
found in the desert in an archae archaeological expedition, you know. So I went and did and I got a crash course at the at the college. The lady was great. She lent me all of her videos on their digs. I had it all down. I had charts, I had photos, I had everything. Gave it all to Tony, and Tony just threw it out the window and says, No, Brad, that's not how they do that. I said, What do you mean that's not how they do it? I just got it from the experts. So I say, okay. So I so that's why I placed it there. And then I decided, you know, what could I do to make this? Oh, I'm making bones of a skinwalker. So that's where I came up with that idea. And so then I went and did a whole bunch of research on the Navajo. And 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 I did a very respectful version of the script, it, respectful to the Navajo legend and all that. Mm -hmm. Of course, Tony destroyed that, you know, I mean, because Tony, you know, that's not how the Navajo legend is. It's this is not Tony's version of it. So um, so went ahead and did that. And then uh, Tony starts coming back with different ideas. And I, I did a whole version of the script. Tony came back and did rewrite ideas and stuff like that. And then I started getting an idea of where this thing was going, you know, and I'm like, ah, oh, this is, this is not going to be like a, 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 and in fairness, I should have known because I'd been on the set for another film that he shot between the first version of Werewolf and this version of Werewolf. But I, I still, you know, had high hopes that it was going to be something serious. And uh, a good buddy of mine was working for Stan Winston at the time. He's doing the creature effects. He did the Stegosaurus for uh, Jurassic Park 2. Okay. Him, him and his two buddies said, look, Brad, we want this film to look good for you. So we'll do all the effects, complete transformations, just like, you know, American Werewolf in London style stuff. We'll transform, we'll, we'll do everything for you, the cost of materials. And that was 10 grand. So I went back to Tony. I said, Tony, these guys, they do Jurassic Park. They do Independence Day. They do, you know, this, that, the other. That's too much damn money, Brad. I get, I get the best effects. And that's how we get the werewolf head that, you know, this tongue flips out. Wow. Can you imagine? Yes. I, I mean, to, to go from the guy who did the Stegosaurus to, I don't know what I was looking at there, but it looked like a hand puppet with some Muppet Bird glued onto it. It's, I it's mean, pretty, pretty close to that. It's like a little head statue that, that, that spins around and stuff. I don't even know where he found this effects guy. I've never heard of the effects house at all. You know, it's like it was out of a guy's garage or something. So I said, okay, so now I know what we're dealing with here with this. Cause and he was all excited. He brought in the bones, you know, and Brad, you got to see the effects. He's got the bones, you know, the werewolf. And, and then he's got the head and us. And I'm just going, oh my God. You know, cause here I had, I had the guys that were doing Stan Winston stuff. They were going to do it on their time, you know, as a favor to me because they were my buddies for the cost of materials because they didn't want me to have a shitty looking film, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so now we, now we know where that was going. So then uh, I'm doing rewrites back and forth. And then one day Tony says, uh, he says, Brad, he says, I got us a gig. We're going to go down to San Diego University to the speak to the film class about filmmaking. You're going to be the screenwriter and the director. Mm -hmm. So we start driving down there. And all of a sudden Tony says, Brad, I've come up with the greatest idea. This is horrifying. He says, it's, it's suspense. It's Hitchcock. He says, you, you've got to write this into the script. And I go, well, what is it, Tony? And he says, Brad, the werewolf drives the car. And I go, what? He goes, Brad, the werewolf drives the car. He goes, the suspense, Brad, the suspense. It's, 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 it's like Splash. And I said, Tony, Splash was a comedy. He goes, no, 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 Brad. The, the, the mermaid was in the back of the taxi cab and, and, and she couldn't get, I said, she was a mermaid, Tony. She couldn't get out of the taxi cab. I said, that was, that, that there's nothing suspenseful. No, Brad, you don't know nothing. All you know is Chainsaw Massacre. You know this, you know that. You write all this horrible. No, this is suspense. I'm telling you, it's like Hitchcock. You got to write it. So I went back and I, I wrote the scene, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, gave it to Tony and Tony calls me up. Brad, this is fabulous. He says, I love it so much. I'm going to play the security guard that turns into the werewolf. And so from that point on, Whenever I did rewrites, I would submit something and I'm going, okay, this is, this is going to be ridiculous. Let's see what he does with it. And, and he took that and he took it seriously. And uh, when the movie was done, we had screenings at the American film market. Whenever Tony screened a film at the American film market, every producer there came to the screenings because they knew they were in for like the biggest laugh of their life. And uh, Tony always thought he's making serious movies. So we do the screening and uh, you know, the scene where, uh, where the, the girl's being chased and she's falling in the mud and there's no mud on her dress. And yeah. <laughs> every, so the whole place is just dying laughing and it's a packed theater. And normally at the, the film arc, there's only three or four buyers or 10 buyers and think this is packed with every producer in there and they're just dying. And Tony jumps up in front of the whole crowd. He gets in front of the screen. He goes, what, why are you laughing? Can't you see he's going to kill the woman? 
he's going to kill the woman. And that just made the place even go crazier. So Tony, up till the up until the end, he thought he had a serious film. He thought he directed, you know, a real serious horror film. And we know what it was. And so did Mystery Science Theater. But <laughs> But I mean, and, and I'm just trying to put myself in those shoes there, being in that room and like, but okay, you're not making a serious horror movie, but you've got a packed theater. Somebody here is going to pick this up and have interest if you just spin it the right way. Yeah. You've got to put it in front of the right eyes. That's all you got to do. Yeah. So so we, what he got was he got to deal with, um, I forget what the company is. But they did the the, the three, they did that. Well, they did on uh, VHS first because that was... Mm-hmm. VHS in those days. Yeah. And they, they did it uh, with the, the first 3D changing box ever on v, VHS, where you turn it one and it's Paul's face and you turn it the other way and it turns into the werewolf. Mm-hmm. You know, so they had a gimmick going on the thing. And so they started distributing it and it started selling in foreign countries. They started you know, making sales for foreign countries and, and they were doing pretty good with that. But Tony was still pissed off because nobody was taking it serious because he still thought he had a serious movie. Even with the even with the with the artwork, you can see it's like. And even the ad that the, the film company did was first there was Pinocchio 3D. Now there's this, you know, and it's like he just didn't get it. And uh, so the movie, the movie came out on, on VHS and, and I went and did other stuff. And then uh, uh, he had contracted me to write a second film for him. And so I wrote the second movie for him as part of my, my original contract. And it, it was called uh, Blood of His Own. And this was Tony's version of at the time uh uh what was that movie uh a crying game came out right mm-hmm. won academy awards and right. Tony's like brad this is my crying game he says it's 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 and so he gave me all of his what he wanted in it and I, it was a crying shame is what it was it was uh he he had written this he, he won this film it's about a guy that grows up with it when he's a kid in italy with his brother and his brother leaves and go somehow they get separated and, and his brother ends up in America well the guy grows up and becomes an adult and comes to America to find his brother and so he's searching America for his brother he's searching he got a lead some he's in some city and uh in the process he falls in love with this waitress at this at this coffee shop well the, the, the whole thing with the thing is in the end it finds out that the waitress he fell in love with is his brother that had a sex change mm-hmm. so there's his crying game and uh so I, I did that film. I wrote that one for Tony and he got that made and he got, he actually got theatrical distribution in Texas for like a month in like several theaters. He got, he did screenings in LA. He did this one screening before the movie was released. He did a screening uh, for the, for the uh, media. And there's a, a big magazine out here called LA weekly and they reviewed it. And they said uh, it's the most unintentionally hilarious film in cinematic history. And Tony didn't know what that meant. And he made made like 150 posters and he put it as a quote on the posters and he took it to the American film market to raise money for the distribution, foreign distribution. And people were cracking up and he goes, what what are you laughing? And they go, don't you know what this means? And he goes, so they explained it to him and he burnt every one of the posters. He destroyed them all. No, 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 this is not what it's supposed to be. So, um, so then he, he released that thing. And then, uh, I stopped working with him because he wasn't going to pay me any more money. And I, I lost money doing werewolf. I did so many rewrites and, and everything. And I got a flat fee because of the, the, the one that was going to take place in Russia, I was getting get paid by the, by the producers. Mm-hmm. This one, I just did a flat fee deal with Tony because I needed the money because my dad was sick. So I did these two back to back and I didn't make anything on them, but I, I lived up to my deal and I, I promised to do all the rewrites and I did the rewrites. So I ended up, you know, in the hole on the thing. Cause I spent, I don't know, a year and a half doing the two movies or something because I had to re- and I and they were all done on typewriters. So I didn't have a computer mm-hmm. back then. It was back in the early nineties, and so every rewrite I'd have to rewrite everything on a typewriter. So that that was a feat in itself. So um, so then I, I I didn't see Tony for several years, and uh, I'd bump into him once in a while at the film market, but I, I wouldn't work. He wanted me to write some more stuff for him, and I didn't want to do it because I just I couldn't afford to do it. And uh, then one day I was in a Barnes and Noble, and I saw this magazine sci-fi magazine you're probably familiar with it mm-hmm. and so there was a thing mystery science theater 3000 and i'm looking through it and uh you know i i, I was familiar with mystery science theater and there's a, this article on their 20th anniversary and there's this picture of this thing it says werewolf and so i start reading the article and it ends up that they had picked up werewolf and had been on mystery science theater and now it's in their 20th anniversary edition box set and i'm like my mind's like 
you know, I, I had no idea it was even on Mystery Science Theater. This is Tony how you're finding out. Yeah, Tony didn't tell me it be, because he was embarrassed by it, but he took the money and ran, you know, that kind of a deal. Uh -huh. and what he should have done was embraced it because then he could have marketed the thing. You know, he could have, if he had played his cards right with this thing, he could have had video games, you know, uh -huh. and, you know, merchandising, everything. He, he just, he didn't do it. Especially now, it would be great to, you know, have that. There are so many movies that wind up on that show that get a second life because of that. They find their audience or they they take on a life that maybe not wasn't intended, but people just start to, to soak it up and just enjoy the, the unique experience that was in, in making it. And Werewolf was a perfect example of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, this thing, I, I couldn't I couldn't believe the audience response to the thing. And so I joined the Werewolf, I mean, the Werewolf, the Mystery Science Theater uh, Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, I'd start throwing a couple of things out there like a the original page that I wrote for the notes of uh, when he turns the werewolf turns into uh, turns into everyone the driver the werewolf's driving the car and that kind of stuff, and it, I get just tons of fan response. You know, like six hundred hits on it, and you know hundreds of comments and questions, and and I love interacting with these guys. You know, the, the audience is the greatest audience. <laughs> the MSTK audience is just fantastic people. They're just amazing. I love them all. They're just great, and they, and they got great senses of humor. Well, we're all just fans of movies in general. We, we, people have this idea that we want to just see movies get torn apart, and we really don't. Speaking oh, yeah, of, you guys appreciate a good movie. I mean, yeah. but you also appreciate a bad one. Yeah. And speaking at least for myself, as like I said it on an earlier episode, I, I like to talk about these movies because I know even though they wind up on the show and they get made fun of, there was a moment when people sat down at a table with a script and a plan and said, this is a great idea. We should do this. And in that moment, it makes sense. And I respect that. Sure. Sure. I mean, like I say, when, when, when I wrote this thing, I wrote a serious script, mm -hmm. you know, I just, it went the way it went. And I'm, and I'm really happy it did because if, even if Tony would have done a half-assed decent job of directing it seriously, it would have still just been a mediocre werewolf film, but this mm -hmm. has taken on a whole new life. It's a, you know, it's a cult classic basically. And it's got a, a, a wonderful audience, a cult audience that, that just love it. I mean, everybody that I know of my friends, we can watch it countless times and we'll laugh our asses off every time we see it. We will find something. We were laughing so hard last time we missed this. And I wrote the damn thing and I still find stuff that, you know, but it's like, and, and, and the comments I get from the, from the, the, from the from the Facebook page, these people tell me that they watch it more than they watch Scarface and their, their favorite movies. Mm hmm I mean, you couldn't ask for more. It becomes a comfort food. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a great way of putting it. I, I got a comment last night uh, that that when you're watching this movie, because it is just so absurd and, and the visuals are what they are and the acting is what it is, it's like at any moment, it you almost feel like it could turn into porn. It never does, <laughs> but it's right on that edge. It's on that edge. It's got like a little bit of a pornographic feel to it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's... People... This is the type of movie that we just don't see as much of these days because we always have the idea that everything has to look and sound completely perfect. And just to put something together for the sake of trying something new, is it, it, it's, I'm not saying it never happens these days, but it doesn't happen the way it did in, you know, the early 90s. Right, right. And, and you know, the thing about this that I was, I was thinking the other day too is I, I respect somebody that makes a low budget film for nothing. And even if it comes out crappy, they, they made it and they 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 did what they did and they thought they were doing something right. And then you see these blockbusters that are just terrible, that have unlimited budgets. And it's like somebody should have caught on that this thing's going to stink. You know, mm -hmm. at some point you should have gone, we got too much money for this to come out as crappy as it is. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like it amazes me because 90 percent of the stuff that goes in the theaters these days is garbage, you know, mm -hmm. and it's. And it's all politically correct. So it takes the guts out of the stories. It, you know, all the great films that were made in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and stuff like that. You know, they were, it's, you know, they, 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 they were unfiltered pretty much. The directors, you know, Sam Peckinpah and, you know, uh, John Frankenheimer, guys like that. You know, they, they just went for it. But these I, days, I, everybody's like trying to play it safe. And, and then you get this watered down thing. You know, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you know, in, in my generation, we, we went to the never ending story and, you know, a kid's movie and a horse drowns. I mean, it, it's like you don't shield the audience from that, even if they're kids. It's like, OK, this is going to happen. It's going to suck. But it's part of the story. Yeah. 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 So it's, you know, it's it's um, I'm, I'm just I, that's why I, I have a lot of respect for what Tony did. He, you know, he passed away in, in 2016. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but I have a lot of respect for what he did because I, I I hear people that have worked on films with him and they bitch and moan because you know they didn't get paid enough and the conditions. Were, well, you know what? You're working on a low budget movie. You, the, I've worked on plenty of low budget movies, and I I go in just whatever happens happens. You know, if we end mm -hmm. up having to sleep in the van, we sleep in the van. You know, it's just it's like touring with a rock band. You know, you do what you got to do, and and you just try. The whole objective is to get the the movie done with whatever you've got to work with. And if you can accomplish that, then you succeeded, in my opinion. You know, it's it's so it's um, you know I just I feel bad like the actors have distanced themselves. Except I heard that uh, I heard that R.C. Bates has been really cool with fans. About okay, it. I heard that he's been real nice. But the actors, I mean, I, I don't even know if they're doing anything anymore. But they they I mean, you never see them posting anything on on any any of the websites or anything like that. And there's a bunch of fan pages. I I was under the, I. I... Kind of tracked out a few of them. I don't know of any major work being done right now at the moment. I would be interested in talking to some of them, but I, again, if it's not their their jam, I don't want to, you know, track somebody down and beat them over the head with it. And well, if Tony were here, I, I would have nothing but respect for him, even if we disagree on the final result. I get, it. I respect the fact that he did it. Yeah, and he'd do the interview. I mean, he when when Werewolf came out after Werewolf came out and it sold it sold a lot it sold a lot of copies of VHS. It did it did really well. He he got a front page story in the Sunday LA Times calendar section, which at that time, that was like the biggest entertainment thing. And mm -hmm. for Tony to pull that off, because every week it was, you know, some big film project, you know, and it was called like the last action hero director or something, the story. And it's and I had to give Tony because Tony was a hustler, man. He like I say he made 23 films in 50 years. And so he was making movies when I knew him, he was making like he was finishing a movie from start to finish one every two years or one every year and a half and and that, that's that's a hustler man that's a guy mm -hmm. that's hustling so you know and and i know you did stuff like he'll do one take I do a whole movie almost everything's just one take move on you know move on move on but then you get the film done whereas other guys would be out there for five years trying to get something done then they it just falls through at the end they have to trash the film you know it just goes it on the shelf it almost sounds like he just missed the real boom in independent film when when you could crank out movies like that and really make a name for yourself, I mean that it's like the the werewolf era was just a year or two too early for that. Am I kind of correct in thinking that? I, I, you know, it could be. I I don't know. Like I say, the 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 thing that really that really made it take off was when MSTK picked it up, mm -hmm. and it's got more popular since then. I mean, I guess because I didn't even know it was on MSTK until I saw the art, article in the magazine. And since then, I see stuff on MSTK all over the place. And it's more prevalent than it ever was now. And uh, I really, you know, that's really helped. Like you say, it, it, I'm sure it's helped a lot of other films too. And I and I wish I would have gotten some of the rights for this thing because I, I would be really doing something with it right now. I mean, it, it's it's ready to be re-released. Re and, you know, I, I, I like the Mystery Science Theater format the best. Mm -hmm. But it's ready for an audience that's never seen it. You know, I mean, people these days need a good laugh and it doesn't get any better than the MSTK version, you know? Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I mean, that's that's just some of the funniest stuff ever. And like you said, this this could be video games. It could be a, a YouTube series. There, there's no end of places you could take this. Yeah. People are just willing to embrace it and get, getting the original talent on. If we could talk them into it, would be great. Yeah, I and I don't know who has the rights. I, I think his brother does. His brother's in Iran. He's a cinematographer over there. And his brother's actually done like some big epic films in Iran, you know, like, you know, the 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 stuff of casts of thousands, because that's where he lives. And, he, and he's, he's, he's been around for, oh, what, doing films for 56 years also. But I never met his brother in person, but I think he probably reverted the rights to his brother. I don't know. I wish I wish I still have the contract I signed with Tony. One of these days, I'm going to have to find an entertainment attorney to take a look at it and see if there's a loophole, because I did write the thing and I ended up with nothing. You know, and I, I'm just wondering if there's something because Tony wrote the contract, so I'm wondering if there might be something there. So I'm just, you know, one of these days, I'll, maybe I'll find out. Well, you know, if MST3K got the rights to show it, so, that there's somebody you can contact. There's somebody who can be uh, who can be tapped on the shoulder on this. Because so whoever has it isn't doing anything with it right now. Right. They're just right. sitting on it. You know, they're just sitting on it. And this thing is this thing's ready to go again. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like it's ready for a, a huge audience. I mean, how many how many uh 
people are, are fans of MSTK, like 50,000 or something. Or I mean, just on the the fan, the the you know, the fan site you saw my my art, my thing on. Sure. You know, there, mm -hmm. I mean, there's at least 50,000 there. I went to a, this is funny too. Back when uh, I didn't know it was on MSTK, I went to a uh, to a, a Christmas dinner with a friend of mine at his brother's in LA. And I didn't know any of the people there. And we sit down to dinner and my buddy starts telling these people, there's a bunch of strangers out there. And he starts telling me, yeah, Brad wrote this movie called Werewolf years ago. And all of a sudden this British lady, that was, she actually worked for a big law firm, an entertainment law firm. She goes, Werewolf? She goes, that's my favorite movie, mate. And I go, what? She goes, oh yeah. And she starts quoting all the lines from the film. And I, and I forgot what I wrote. And she, I mean, she went on the whole dinner quoting Werewolf. And this was before MSTK 3000. And, and I was just like, where did that come from? It's so random out of nowhere. I mean, she just loved the film. So I know there's a lot of people out there that really dig it, you know? No, I, for sure, for sure. And it's a, we're, we're at a stage now where, you know, you mentioned before that movies are repetitive these days, that, 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 that what's out in the theater is is not the greatest. A lot of that is because some of the IPs are, are getting stale, but people are looking to get into something that that has some teeth to it and has some fun to it too. Yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing with more teeth than a werewolf, right? That's funny. <laughs> but it's like, um, yeah, I, I think the thing's got a, a whole new life. Do, do you know, I know you're a convention guy, right? That's correct. Do you, have you, has there ever been any MSTK stuff at conventions? A lot of times. It's usually, um, they haven't done an actual MST3K convention in quite a few years, mm -hmm. but you'll always see somebody with an MST3K shirt, or I've seen people dressed up as Crow or Tom Servo. I mean, those people are definitely out there. And those are the, the cryptic, you know, th those are the costumes that you want to reward because of the, you get the joke. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's it's. I, I was just curious because I, like, I have a buddy. He was the uh, you, you saw the people under the stairs, or, or are you at least familiar with it? Mm -hmm. My buddy was the 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 stair keeper. He was the the monster under the stairs, you know. And and he's been writing that thing. He he goes to he gets invited to conventions, like ten a year all over the country. They fly him out to do panels and stuff, you know. And and I'm going, man, if that thing's still kicking, I I think that MSTK three thousands version of Werewolf would still be kicking, you know. You know, there's there's some ideas I could bounce off with you off off camera. We could probably go that route. There, there's some th things that are starting to come up in my head right now. Well, good. Keep it in keep it in mind. Sure, Let sure thing, sure thing. Well, Brett, I do appreciate the shocking about this here. I appreciate you being here. Um, where can people follow your adventures on the web? Uh, well, they can mostly follow my adventures through my band Civil Defiance. Let's go to our Civil Defiance Facebook page, or you go to our Bandcamp page. Or uh, and also, you know, we've got a lot of stuff on YouTube. I don't know if you saw any of the, if you saw the the dog video that I referred, I sent you a, a thing about. Mm -hmm. But um, my my band right now, we're it's it's it, we're actually doing we're getting ready to go in and do our newest album. We we were separated for a few years because my buddy joined. He did another band with a guy from Slayer, and and uh, but now we started recording a new a new album and. And uh, we, we're working with the engineer that does all Los Lobos' stuff. We record in their studio. And uh, he actually um, he actually engineered their Grammy-winning album a couple of years ago, American, was it Native Son? Native Son, that's what it was, Native Son. But uh, yeah, they, you can find out about my stuff there. And I, I plan to get back into writing and stuff, but right now I've got to keep a roof over my head. And, and uh, you know, and, I'm, and I, I've got, I've got, in storage, I've got a ton of stuff on Werewolf. I've got every page of every version i wrote i've got notes on stuff and i hope to dig some of that stuff out sometime and post some of that on the on the mstk 3000 page that'd so, be sweet when you yeah. release your albums do you do them on you know vinyl or just mp3 do you do physical cds oh, we, we do we do cds we do because in germany where we have a huge audience well pretty a, a big audience in germany and, and uh, greece and those countries they still cds their main thing over there but we do it all on you know on the streaming services we do we're going to do vinyl we're going to start doing vinyl we haven't done vinyl yet the first band I, I wrote for back in the early 90s or the early 80s that was all vinyl because that's what it was then right and uh you know and and, and I've, I've i've had songs in movies and stuff like that I had a song in a karate kid has song in a thing called hearts of fire with bob dylan and 
stuff like that. So I've I've done a lot of I've been music's been my thing since the since about 1980. Sure. And I, I don't want to downplay that. I got so sidetracked on, on Werewolf that I, I, I kind of sidestepped the, the music angle there. Oh, that's all right. No problem. You know, Werewolf, the audience, the audience for this is Werewolf. But sure. if you're interested, they should check out Civil Defiance and check out our, our Bandcamp page, listen to some of the stuff. Check out the I Have the Dog video. We just did that just before the uh, just before COVID hit. And we had a lot of steam going and then COVID hit and everything got shut down, locked up. We released that right before then, and it's it's on YouTube. So, and it's 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 an interesting video. And seeing that you're a dog lover, it's about how dogs how dogs see and sense stuff that we don't, and try to protect us from harm in the world. That is really true. And uh, so it's called "Eye of the Dog," and it's like we see somebody a certain way, and they see them a whole different way. You, I see you have a dog over there. How many dogs you got? One. I just got one. Yeah, my buddy's got two. They're like my dogs, and the one that's in "Eye of the Dog" that's his dog, but she was a. Uh, you take her to the bar and everybody loves her, you know, and she's cool with everybody. But every once in a while, somebody will walk up that seems perfectly normal and she'll start snarling and growling and you'll just know there's something wrong with this person. Mm-hmm. They know. know. They know. They can sense it. And so that's mm-hmm. the whole idea behind Eye of the Dog. She might be, we're looking at him one way and she might be seeing in her head, you know, crows pecking out eyes or something, you know, there's something wrong with this guy. So that's the, the imagery and stuff from that. Well, everything you mentioned is going to be on the show notes on my website, aaronbossig.com. So your band camp's going to be there, your links to your YouTube channel, any information on your band that I can find is going to be on there. So that's like a conduit people can go to and get like a one-stop shop on all the information we've got. Great. And and anybody can, you know, if, if they want to get a hold of me, they, you know, they can they can contact me through the Civil Defiance page or, you know, send me a request or something like that, you know, because I'm, I'm real active with the fans. My My band fans are all over the world. I'm in touch with them all the time. And I love the MSTK fans. They're just wonderful. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear from them. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, Brad, I would be glad to have you back anytime. And I would really looking forward to checking out that stuff. All right. Great. Sounds good, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. All right, Aaron. And I'll, I guess I'll talk to you soon. Yeah.